The Zohar, Hebrew, Zohar lit. Splendor, or Radiance, is the foundational work in the literature of Jewish mystical thought known as Kabbalah. It is a group of books including commentary on the mystical aspects of the Torah, the five books of Moses, and scriptural interpretations, as well as material on mysticism, mythical cosmogony, and mystical psychology. The Zohar contains discussions of the nature of God, the origin and structure of the universe, the nature of souls, redemption, the relationship of ego to darkness and true self, to the light of God, and the relationship between the universal energy and man. Its scriptural exegesis can be considered an esoteric form of the rabbinic literature known as Midrash, which elaborates on the Torah. Topic. Language. The Zohar is mostly written in what has been described as a cryptic, obscure style of Aramaic. Aramaic, the day-to-day -day language of Israel in the Second Temple period 539 BCE to 70 CE, was the original language of large sections of the biblical books of Daniel and Ezra, and is the main language of the Talmud. <inaudible> Origin The Zohar first appeared in Spain in the 13th century, and was published by a Jewish writer named Moses de Leon. De Leon ascribed the work to Shimon bar Yochai, Rashbi, a rabbi of the 2nd century during the Roman persecution who, according to Jewish legend, hid in a cave for 13 years studying the Torah and was inspired by the prophet Elijah to write the Zohar. This accords with the traditional claim by adherents that Kabbalah is the concealed part of the oral Torah. Acceptance within Judaism While the traditional majority view in religious Judaism has been that the teachings of Kabbalah lit. Tradition were revealed by God to biblical figures such as Abraham and Moses and were then transmitted orally from the biblical era until their redaction by Shimon bar Yochai. Modern academic analysis of the Zohar, such as that by the 20th century religious historian Gershom Sholem, has theorized that De Leon was the actual author. The view of some Orthodox Jews and Orthodox groups, as well as non-Orthodox Jewish denominations, generally conforms to this latter view, and as such, most such groups have long viewed the Zohar as pseudepigraphy and apocrypha, while sometimes accepting that its contents may have meaning for modern Judaism. Jewish prayer books edited by non-Orthodox Jews may therefore contain excerpts from the Zohar and other Kabbalistic works, even if the editors do not literally believe that they are oral traditions from the time of Moses. Impact outside Judaism There are people of religions besides Judaism, or even those without religious affiliation, who delve in the Zohar out of curiosity, or as a technology for seeking meaningful and practical answers about the meaning of their lives, the purpose of creation and existence and their relationships with the laws of nature, and so forth, however from the perspective of traditional, rabbinic Judaism, and by the Zohar's own statements, the purpose of the Zohar is to help the Jewish people through and out of the exile and to infuse the Torah and mitzvah Judaic commandments with the wisdom of Moses de Leon's Kabbalah for its Jewish readers. Etymology <inaudible> <inaudible> In the Bible, the word, Zohar, appears in the vision of Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 2 and is usually translated as meaning radiance or light. It appears again in Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 2. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. Topic: Authorship. Topic: Initial view. Suspicions aroused by the facts that the Zohar was discovered by one person and that it refers to historical events of the post-Talmudic period while purporting to be from an earlier time, caused the authorship to be questioned from the outset. Joseph Jacobs and Isaac Broyd, in their article on the Zohar for the 1906 Jewish Encyclopedia, cite a story involving the Kabbalist Isaac of Akko, who is supposed to have heard directly from the widow of De Leon that her husband proclaimed authorship by Shimon bar Yochai for profit. A story tells that after the death of Moses de Leon, a rich man of Avila named Joseph offered Moses's widow who had been left without any means of supporting herself a large sum of money for the original from which her husband had made the copy. 
She confessed that her husband himself was the author of the work. She had asked him several times, she said, why he had chosen to credit his own teachings to another, and he had always answered that doctrines put into the mouth of the miracle-working Shimon Bar Yochai would be a rich source of profit. The story indicates that shortly after its appearance the work was believed by some to have been written by Moses de Leon. However, Isaac evidently ignored the woman's alleged confession in favor of the testimony of Joseph ben Todros and of Jacob, a pupil of Moses de Leon, both of whom assured him on oath that the work was not written by de Leon. Isaac's testimony, which appeared in the first edition 1566 of Sefer Uchassan, was censored from the second edition 1580 and remained absent from all editions thereafter until its restoration nearly 300 years later in the 1857 edition. Rabbi Aryeh Kaplan notes that Isaac evidently did not believe her since Isaac quotes the Zohar was authored by Rabbi Shimon bar Yohai in a manuscript in Rabbi Kaplan's possession. This leads him to hypothesize that Moses de Leon's wife sold the original manuscript, as parchment was very valuable, and was embarrassed by the realization of its high ancient worth, leading her to claim it was written by her husband. Rabbi Kaplan concludes saying this was the probable series of events, the Zohar spread among the Jews with remarkable swiftness. Scarcely fifty years had passed since its appearance in Spain before it was quoted by many Kabbalists, including the Italian mystical writer Menachem Reconati and by Todros Abulafia. Certain Jewish communities, however, such as the Dordame, Andalusian, Western Sephardic or Spanish and Portuguese Jews, and some Italian communities, never accepted it as authentic. Topic. Late Middle Ages By the 15th century, its authority in the Spanish Jewish community was such that Joseph ibn Shem Tov drew from it arguments in his attacks against Maimonides, and even representatives of non-mystical Jewish thought began to assert its sacredness and invoke its authority in the decision of some ritual questions. In Jacob's and Broid's view, they were attracted by its glorification of man, its doctrine of immortality, and its ethical principles, which they saw as more in keeping with the spirit of Talmudic Judaism than are those taught by the philosophers, and which was held in contrast to the view of Maimonides and his followers, who regarded man as a fragment of the universe whose immortality is dependent upon the degree of development of his active intellect. The Zohar instead declared man to be the lord of the creation, whose immortality is solely dependent upon his morality. Conversely, Elijah Delmedigo c. C. in his Bechanat Ha-Dat endeavored to show that the Zohar could not be attributed to Shimon bar Yochai, by a number of arguments. He claims that if it were his work, the Zohar would have been mentioned by the Talmud, as has been the case with other works of the Talmudic period. He claims that had Bar Yochai known by divine revelation the hidden meaning of the precepts, his decisions on Jewish law from the Talmudic period would have been adopted by the Talmud, that it would not contain the names of rabbis who lived at a later period than that of Bar Yochai. He claims that if the Kabbalah was a revealed doctrine, there would have been no divergence of opinion among the Kabbalists concerning the mystic interpretation of the precepts. Believers in the authenticity of the Zohar countered that the lack of references to the work in Jewish literature was because Bar Yohai did not commit his teachings to writing but transmitted them orally to his disciples over generations until finally the doctrines were embodied in the Zohar. They found it unsurprising that Bar Yochai should have foretold future happenings or made references to historical events of the post Talmudic period. The authenticity of the Zohar was accepted by such 16th century Jewish luminaries as R. Yosef Karo, D. R. Moses Isorals, D. and R. Solomon Luria, D. who wrote that Jewish law halacha follows the Zohar, except where the Zohar is contradicted by the Babylonian Talmud. However, R. Soloman Luria admits in response 98 that the Zohar can't override a minhag. Topic. Enlightenment period Debate continued over the generations. Delmedigo's arguments were echoed by Leon of Modena D. in his Ari Nohem, and a work devoted to the criticism of the Zohar, Mitpach's Sephirim, was written by Jacob Emden, D. who, waging war against the remaining adherents of the Sabbatai Zevi movement, in which Zevi, a false messiah and Jewish apostate, cited messianic prophecies from the Zohar as proof of his legitimacy, endeavored to show that the book on which Zevi based his doctrines was a forgery. 
Emden argued that the Zohar misquotes passages of scripture, misunderstands the Talmud, contains some ritual observances that were ordained by later rabbinical authorities, mentions the Crusades against Muslims who did not exist in the 2nd century, uses the expression esnoga, a Portuguese term for synagogue, and gives a mystical explanation of the Hebrew vowel points, which were not introduced until long after the Talmudic period. In the Ashkenazi community of Eastern Europe, religious authorities including the Vilna Gaon D. and Rabbi Schnorr Zalman of Liadi D. the Baal Hatanya believed in the authenticity of the Zohar. Acceptance was not uniform, however. The Noda Bihuda D. in his Sefer Derashe Hotslach, argued that the Zohar is to be considered unreliable as it came into our hands many hundreds of years after Rashbi's death and it lacks an unbroken mesorah as to its authenticity, among other reasons. The influence of the Zohar and the Kabbalah in Yemen, where it was introduced in the 17th century, contributed to the formation of the Dor Deah movement, led by Rabbi Yiya Kaffa in the later part of the 19th century, whose adherents believed that the core beliefs of Judaism. Judaism were rapidly diminishing in favor of the mysticism of the Kabbalah. Among its objects was the opposition of the influence of the Zohar and subsequent developments in modern Kabbalah, which were then pervasive in Yemenite Jewish life, restoration of what they believed to be a rationalistic approach to Judaism rooted in authentic sources, and safeguardal of the older Baladi tradition of Yemenite Jewish observance that preceded the Kabbalah. Especially controversial were the views of the Dor Dame on the Zohar, as presented in Milhamoth Hashem, Wars of the Lord, written by Rabbi Kaffa. A group of Jerusalem rabbis published an attack on Rabbi Kaffa under the title of Amunit Hashem, Faith of the Lord, taking measures to ostracize members of the movement. Notwithstanding, not even the Yemenite rabbis who opposed the Dor Dame heeded this ostracization. Instead, they intermarried, sat together in Batay Midrash, and continued to sit with Rabbi Kaffa in Beth Din. Topic. Contemporary religious view Most of Orthodox Judaism holds that the teachings of Kabbalah were transmitted from teacher to teacher, in a long and continuous chain, from the biblical era until its redaction by Shimon ben Yochai. Some fully accept the claims that the Kabbalah's teachings are in essence a revelation from God to the biblical patriarch Abraham, Moses and other ancient figures, but were never printed and made publicly available until the time of the Zohar's medieval publication. The greatest acceptance of this sequence of events is held within Haredi Judaism, especially Chassidic groups. R. Yeshiel Michel Epstein D. and R. Yisrael Meir Kagan D. both believed in the authenticity of the Zohar. Rabbis Eliyahu Dessler D. and Gedalia Nadal D. maintained that it is acceptable to believe that the Zohar was not written by Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai and that it had a late authorship. Some claim the tradition that Rabbi Shimon wrote that the concealment of the Zohar would last for exactly 1,200 years from the time of the destruction of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. The Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 CE and so before revealing the Zohar in 1270, Moses de Leon uncovered the manuscripts in a cave in Israel. Within Orthodox Judaism the traditional view that Shimon bar Yochai was the author is prevalent. R. Menachem Mendel Kasher in a 1958 article in the periodical Sinai argues against the claims of Gershom Sholem that the Zohar was written in the 13th century by R. Moses de Leon. He writes, Many statements in the works of the Rishonim medieval commenters who preceded de Leon refer to Medrashim that we are not aware of. He writes that these are in fact references to the Zohar. This has also been pointed out by R. David Luria in his work, Cadmus Sefer HaZohar. The Zohar's major opponent Elijah Delmedigo refers to the Zohar as having existed for only 300 years. Even he agrees that it was extant at the time of R. Moses de Leon. He cites a document from R. Yitchak M. Akko who was sent by the Ramban to investigate the Zohar. The document brings witnesses that attest to the existence of the manuscript. It is impossible to accept that R. Moshe de Leon managed to forge a work within the scope of the Zohar 1700 pages within a period of six years as Sholem claims. A comparison between the Zohar and de Leon's other works show major stylistic differences. Although he made use of his manuscript of the Zohar, many ideas presented in his works contradict or ignore ideas mentioned in the Zohar. Luria also points this out. 
Many of the Midrashic works achieved their final redaction in the Geonic period. Some of the anachronistic terminologies of the Zohar may date from that time. Out of the thousands of words used in the Zohar, Sholem finds two anachronistic terms and nine cases of ungrammatical usage of words. This proves that the majority of the Zohar was written within the accepted time frame and only a small amount was added later in the Geonic period as mentioned. Some hard-to-understand terms may be attributed to acronyms or codes. He finds corollaries to such a practice in other ancient manuscripts. The borrowings from medieval commentaries may be explained in a simple manner. It is not unheard of that a note written on the side of a text should on later copying be added to the main part of the text. The Talmud itself has geonic additions from such a cause. Certainly, this would apply to the Zohar to which there did not exist other manuscripts to compare it with. He cites an ancient manuscript that refers to a book Sad Gadol that seems to in fact be the Zohar. Concerning the Zohar's lack of knowledge of the land of Israel, Sholem bases this on the many references to a city Kaputkia Cappadocia which he states was situated in Turkey, not in Israel. A city by this name located in Israel does appear, however, in Targum Onkelos, Targum Yonatan, Mishnah, Babylonian Talmud and several Midrashim. Another theory as to the authorship of the Zohar is that it was transmitted like the Talmud before it was transcribed, as an oral tradition reapplied to changing conditions and eventually recorded. This view believes that the Zohar was not written by Shimon bar Yochai, but as a holy work because it consisted of his principles. Belief in the authenticity of the Zohar among Orthodox Jewish movements can be seen in various forms online today. Featured on Chabad.org is the multi-part article, The Zohar's Mysterious Origins by Moshe Miller, which views the Zohar as the product of multiple generations of scholarship but defends the overall authenticity of the text and argues against many of the textual criticisms from Sholem and Tishbi. The Zohar figures prominently in the mysticism of Chabad. Another leading Orthodox online outlet, Aish.com, also shows broad acceptance of the Zohar by referencing it in many of its articles. Some in modern Orthodox Judaism reject the above view as naive. Some Orthodox Jews accept the earlier rabbinic position that the Zohar was a work written in the Middle Medieval period by Moses de Leon, but argue that since it is obviously based on earlier materials, it can still be held to be authentic, but not as authoritative or without error as others within Orthodoxy might hold. Jews in non Orthodox Jewish denominations accept the conclusions of historical academic studies on the Zohar and other Kabbalistic texts. As such, most non-Orthodox Jews have long viewed the Zohar as pseudepigraphy and apocrypha. Nonetheless, many accepted that some of its contents had meaning for modern Judaism. Siddurim edited by non-Orthodox Jews often have excerpts from the Zohar and other Kabbalistic works, e.g. Siddur Sim Shalom edited by Jules Harlow, even though the editors are not Kabbalists. In recent years there has been a growing willingness of non-Orthodox Jews to study the Zohar, and a growing minority have a position that is similar to the modern Orthodox position described above. This seems pronounced among Jews who follow the path of Jewish renewal. Topic. Modern critical views The first systematic and critical academic proof for the authorship of Moses de Leon was given by Adolf Jelinek in his 1851 monograph, Moses ben Shem Tob de Leon und sein Verhaltnis zum Sohar, and later adopted by the historian Heinrich Grietz in his History of the Jews, Volume 7. The young Kabbalah scholar Gershom Sholem began his career at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem with a famous lecture in which he promised to refute Greets and Jelinek, but after years of strained research Gershom Sholem contended in 1941 that de Leon himself was the most likely author of the Zohar. Among other things, Sholem noticed the Zohar's frequent errors in Aramaic grammar, its suspicious traces of Spanish words and sentence patterns, and its lack of knowledge of the land of Israel. Other Jewish scholars have also suggested the possibility that the Zohar was written by a group of people, including de Leon. This theory generally presents de Leon as having been the leader of a mystical school, whose collective effort resulted in the Zohar. Even if de Leon wrote the text, the entire contents of the book may not be fraudulent. Parts of it may be based on older works, and it was a common practice to ascribe the authorship of a document to an ancient rabbi in order to give the document more weight. It is possible that Moses de Leon considered himself to be channeling the words of Rabbi Shimon. 
In the Encyclopedia Judaica article written by Professor Gershom Sholem of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem there is an extensive discussion of the sources cited in the Zohar. Sholem views the author of the Zohar as having based the Zohar on a wide variety of pre-existing Jewish sources, while at the same time inventing a number of fictitious works that the Zohar supposedly quotes, e.g., the Sifra de Adam, the Sifra de Hanok, the Sifra de Shelomo Malka, the Sifra de Rav Hamnun Asava, the Sifra de Rav Yiv Asava, the Sifra de Agadetta, the Raza de Raisin and many others. Sholem's views are widely held as accurate among historians of the Kabbalah, but like all textual historical investigations, are not uncritically accepted. Most of the following conclusions are still accepted as accurate, although academic analysis of the original texts has progressed dramatically since Sholem's groundbreaking research. Scholars that continue to research the background of the Zohar include Yehuda Leibs who wrote his doctorate degree for Sholem on the subject of a dictionary of the vocabulary of the Zohar in 1976, and Daniel C. Matt, also a student of Sholem, who is currently reconstructing a critical edition of the Zohar based on original unpublished manuscripts. While many original ideas in the Zohar are presented as being from fictitious Jewish mystical works, many ancient and clearly rabbinic mystical teachings are presented without their real, identifiable sources being named. Academic studies of the Zohar show that many of its ideas are based in the Talmud, various works of Midrash, and earlier Jewish mystical works. Sholem writes, the writer had expert knowledge of the early material and he often used it as a foundation for his expositions, putting into it variations of his own. His main sources were the Babylonian Talmud, the complete Midrash Rabbah, the Midrash Tanhuma, and the two Pesiktat Pesikta de Rav Kahana or Pesikta Rabati, the Midrash on Psalms, the Perke de Rabbi Eliezer, and the Targum Onkelos. Generally speaking, they are not quoted exactly, but translated into the peculiar style of the Zohar and summarized. Less use is made of the Halakhic Midrashim, the Jerusalem Talmud, and the other Targums, nor of the Midrashim like the Agadat Shir Ha Shuram, the Midrash on Proverbs, and the Alphabet de Ar. Akiva. It is not clear whether the author used the Yakit Shimoni, or whether he knew the sources of its Agata separately. Of the smaller Midrashim he used the Haikalot Rabati, the Alphabet de Ben Sira, the Sefer Zerubbabel, the Berida de Massa Bereshit, and many others. The author of the Zohar drew upon the Bible commentaries written by medieval rabbis, including Rashi, Abraham ibn Ezra, David Kimi, and even authorities as late as Nominides and Maimonides. Sholem gives a variety of examples of such borrowings. The Zohar draws upon early mystical texts such as the Sefer Yetzirah and the Bahir, and the early medieval writings of the Hasidic Ashkenaz. Another influence on the Zohar that Sholem, and scholars like Yehuda Liebs and Ronit Miraz have identified was a circle of Spanish Kabbalists in Castile who dealt with the appearance of an evil side emanating from within the world of the Sephirot. Sholem saw this dualism of good and evil within the Godhead as a kind of Gnostic inclination within Kabbalah, and as a predecessor of the Sitra Ara the other, evil side, in the Zohar. The main text of the Castile Circle, the treatise on the left emanation, was written by Jacob Ha Cohen in around 1265. Topic. Contents The Tikkune Hazohar was first printed in Mantua in 1557. The main body of the Zohar was printed in Cremona in 1558, a one-volume edition, in Mantua in 1558 to 1560, a three-volume edition, and in Salonica in 1597, a two-volume edition. Each of these editions included somewhat different texts. When they were printed, there were many partial manuscripts in circulation that were not available to the first printers. These were later printed as Zohar Chadash, lit. New Zohar. But Zohar Chadash actually contains parts that pertain to the Zohar, as well as Tikkunim, plural of tikkun, repair, that are akin to Tikkune Hazohar, as described below. The term, Zohar, in usage, may refer to just the first Zohar collection, with or without the applicable sections of Zohar Chadash, or to the entire Zohar and Tikkunim. Citations referring to the Zohar conventionally follow the volume and page numbers of the Mantua edition, while citations referring to Tikkune Hazohar follow the edition of Ortikoi Constantinople 1719 whose text and pagination became the basis for most subsequent editions. 
Volumes 2 and 3 begin their numbering anew, so citation can be made by parasha and page number e.g. Zohar, Naso 127a, or by volume and page number e.g. Zohar 3, 127a. Unlike other Jewish traditions, which depict God in relatively simple terms, the Zohar is intentionally obscure. As a work it is full of neologisms, linguistic borrowings, occasional grammatical mistakes, and inspired wordplay on rabbinic and biblical passages. Its ideas are often inconsistent and conflicting, referring to abstract concepts that are never completely expressed. Topic. Zohar The earlier part of the Zohar, also known as Zohar al Zohar on the Torah, Zwar el Twer or Midrash Rashbi, contains several smaller books, as described below. This book was published in three volumes, Volume 1 on Bereshit Genesis, Volume 2 on Shemot Exodus, and Volume 3 on Vayikra, Bamidbar and Devarim Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. At the start of the first volume is printed a preface to the Book of the Zohar, pages 1a to 14b. After this introduction is the Zohar's commentary on most of the parashahs of the Torah. There is Zohar on all of the parashahs of Bereshit through the book of Vayikra. In Bamidbar there is no Zohar on the last two parashas, Matat although on this parasha there is a small paragraph on page 259b and Masseh. In Devarim there is no Zohar on Devarim, Rhea, Ki Tavo, Nitzavim, and Vezo Habarakha. Printed within these three volumes are these smaller books, Sifra Ditznauda, Book of the Hidden, Spur Disney this small, Book. Three pages long, Volume 2, Parashat Teruma, pages 176 b 179 a, the name of which, Book of the Hidden, attests to its veiled and cryptic character, is considered by some an important and concentrated part of the Zohar. Its enumerations and anatomical references are reminiscent of the Sefer Yetzirah, the latter being Remazim hints of divine characteristics. Externally it is a commentary on seminal verses in Bereshit and therefore in the version published in Cremona it is printed in Parashat Bereshit. It has five chapters. Intrinsically it includes, according to Rashbi, the foundation of Kabbalah, which is explained at length in the Zohar and in the books of Kabbalah after it. Rabbi Shalom Buzaglo said, Rashbi, may his merit protect us, said Zohar Volume 2, page 176a, Sifra Ditznauda is five chapters that are included in a great palace and fill the entire earth, meaning, these five paragraphs include all the wisdom of Kabbalah. For, Sifra Ditznauda is the little that holds the much, brevity with wonderful and glorious wisdom. There are those who attribute Sifra Ditznoda to the patriarch Yaakov, however, Rabbi Eliezer Tzvi of Kamarno in his book Zohar Chai wrote, Sifra Ditznoda was composed by Rashbi and he arranged it from Bereidas that were transmitted to Tanaim from Mount Sinai from the days of Moshe, similar to the way Rabbinu Hakadish arranged the six orders of Mishnah from that which was repeated from before. Idra Rabbah, the Great Assembly, Dr. Erb the Idra Rabbah is found in the Zohar Volume 3, Parashat Naso pp. 127b 145a, and its name means, the Great Assembly. Idra is a sitting place of sages, usually circular, and the word, Rabbah, Great, differentiates this section from the section Idra Zuda, which was an assembly of fewer sages that occurred later, as mentioned below. Idra Rabbah contains the discussion of nine of Rashbi's friends, who gathered together to discuss great and deep secrets of Kabbalah. The nine are, Rabbi Elazar his son, Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi bar Yaakov, Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Chezkiah bar Rav, Rabbi Chaya, Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Yisa. After the opening of the discussion by Rashbi, the sages rise, one after the other, and lecture on the secret of divinity, while Rashbi adds to and responds to their words. The lectures in this section mainly explain the words of the Sifra Ditznoda, in a similar manner as the Gemara explains the Mishnah, as described in the Idra Rabbah. Before the Idra disjourned, three of the students died Rabbi Yossi bar Yaakov, Rabbi Chezkia bar Rav, and Rabbi Yisa. As it is told, these students filled up with godly light and therefore journeyed to the eternal world after their deaths. The remaining students saw their friends being carried away by angels. Rabbi Shimon said some words and they were calmed. He shouted out, 
Perhaps, God forbid, a decree has been passed upon us to be punished, for through us has been revealed that which has not been revealed since the time Moshe stood on Mount Sinai." At that instant a heavenly voice emerged and said, "'Fortunate are you Rabbi Shimon, and fortunate is your portion and the portion of the friends who remain alive with you. For it has been revealed to you that which has not been revealed to all the upper hosts." Idra Zuta, the smaller assembly. Dr. Zwarthi Idra Zuta is found in the Zohar Volume 3, Parashat Hazinu p. 287b to 296b, and is called Idra Zuta, which means the smaller assembly, distinguishing it from the aforementioned greater assembly, the Idra Rabbah. In the Idra Zuta, Rashbi's colleagues convene again, this time seven in number, after the three mentioned above died. In the Idra Zuta the Shevraya Kadisha are privileged to hear teachings from Rashbi that conclude the words that were explained in the Idra Rabbah. Ra'aya Mahamna, the faithful shepherd Rai Emhim the book Ra'aya Mahamna, the title of which means, the faithful shepherd, and which is by far the largest, book, included in the book of the Zohar, is what Moshe, the faithful shepherd, teaches and reveals to Rashbi and his friends, who include Tanaim and Amaraim. In this assembly of holy friends, which took place in the Beit Midrash of Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, secrets of and revelations on mitzvah of the Torah are explained and clarified roots and deep meanings of mitzvah. Since it deals with mitzvah, from Ra'ya Mahamna it is possible to learn very much about the ways of the halakhic rulings of the rabbis. Ra'ya Mahamna is distributed over several parashio throughout the Zohar. Part of it is known and even printed on separate pages, and part of it is weaved into the body of the Zohar. Ra'ya Mahamna is found in Vols, 2 and 3 of the Zohar, but is not found explicitly in Volume 1. Several great rabbis and sages have tried to find the Ra'ya Mahamna, which originally is a vast book on all the 613 mitzvah, and arrange it according to the order of positive commandments and negative commandments, and even print it as a book on its own. In the lessons at the end of the Zohar, Ra'ya Mahamna is sometimes referred to as Chibra Kadma, the preceding book. Regarding the importance of Ra'ya Mahamna, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero said, Know that this book, which is called Ra'ya Mahamna, which Rashbi made with the Zadikim who are in Gan Eden, was a repair of the Shahina, and an aid and support for it in the exile, for there is no aid or support for the Shahina besides the secrets of the Torah. And everything that he says here of the secrets and the concepts, it is all with the intention of unifying the Shahina and aiding it during the exile, Midrash Hainelam, the hidden Midrash, Emdinyar's Ham Midrash Hainelam is located within the body of the Zohar Parashat Ve'era, Chaye Sarah, Toldot and the Zohar Chadash pp. 2b 30b, 46b 47b in the Zohar Chadash edition by Rav Reuven Margoliat, and in Parashat Balak, Key Tites, and the entire Zohar Chadash on Shir Hashirim, Ruth, and Ika. According to Ramaz, it is fit to be called Midrash Hainelam because its topic is mostly the neshama an upper level of soul, the source of which is in Bera, which is the place of the upper Gan Eden, and it is written in the Pardes that Drash is in Bera. And the revealed Midrash is the secret of externality, and Midrash Hainelam is the secret of internality, which is the neshama. And this Darish is founded on the Neshama, its name befits it, Midrash Hainelam. The language of Midrash Hainelam is sometimes Hebrew, sometimes Aramaic, and sometimes both mixed. Unlike the body of the Zohar, its drashas are short and not long. Also, the topics it discusses the work of creation, the nature of the soul, the days of Mashiach, and Olam Haba are not of the type found in the Zohar, which are the nature of God, the emanation of worlds, the forces of evil, and more. Idra Dive Mashkana, Haikalot, Raza Dirazin, Saba Demishpatim, Tosefta, and Sitre Torah In the Zohar there are more sections that are of different nature with regard to their contents and importance, as follows, Idra Dive Mashkana, Assembly of the House of the Tabernacle deals mainly with the secrets of prayer, and is found in the Zohar Vol. 2, Parashat Mishpatim pp. 122b 123b. Haikalot, Palaces, deals in describing the palaces of Gan Eden, and Gehinnom, and contains many matters related to prayer. 
It is found in the Zohar Volume 1, Parashat Birashit pp. 38a 45b, Volume 2 Parashat Pekadeh pp. 244b 262b, Haikalot of Holiness, pp. 262b 268b, Haikalot of Impurity. Raza Dirazan, Secret of Secrets, deals with revealing the essence of a man via the features of his face and hands. It is found in the Zohar Volume 2, Parashat Yitro, pp. 70a 75a. Saba Demishpatim, the Elder on Statutes, is the commentary of Rav Yiba Saba regarding transmigration of souls, and punishments of the body in the grave. It is found in the Zohar Volume 2, Parashat Mishpatim, pp. 94a 114a. Tosefta are paragraphs containing the beginnings of chapters on the wisdom of the Kabbalah of the Zohar, and it is dispersed in all three volumes of the Zohar. Sitrei Torah are drashas of verses from the Torah regarding matters of the soul and the secret of divinity, and they are dispersed in the Zohar Volume 1. For more books and sources mentioned in the Zohar, see also below. <laughs> Zohar Chadash, the new Zohar, Zwerhart. After the book of the Zohar had been printed in Mantua and in Cremona, in the Jewish years 5318-5320 or 1558-1560 CE, many more manuscripts were found that included paragraphs pertaining to the Zohar in their content and had not been included in printed editions. The manuscripts pertained also to all parts of the Zohar, some were similar to Zohar on the Torah, some were similar to the inner parts of the Zohar Midrash Hainelam, Sitre Oto and more, and some pertained to Tikkunei Hazohar. Some thirty years after the first edition of the Zohar was printed, the manuscripts were gathered and arranged according to the parashas of the Torah and the Megillot apparently the arrangement was done by the Kabbalist, Rabbi Avraham Halevi of Tsfat, and were printed first in Salonika in Jewish year 5357 1587? CE, and then in Krakow 5363, and afterwards many times in various editions, there is Zohar Chadash on the Torah for many parashas across the Chumash, namely, on Chumash Birashit, Birashit, Noach, Lekh Leka, Veera, Veashev, on Chumash Shemot, Beshalik, Yitro, Teruma, Ki Tissa, on Chumash Veikra, Tzav, Akare, Behar, on Chumash Bamidbar, Chukot, Balak, Matat, on Chumash Devarim, Vachanan, Ki Tetz, Ki Tavo, within the paragraphs of Zohar Chadash are inserted Sitre Oto, Secrets of the Letters, and Midrash Hainelam, on separate pages. Afterwards follows the Midrashim, Midrash Hainelam on the Megillot, Shir Hashirim, Ruth, and Ikha. And at the end are printed Tikkunim, Tikkunay Zohar Chadash, Tikkunis were hards like the Tikkunay Hazohar. Tikkunay Hazohar, Rectifications of the Zohar, Tikkunay Hazohar. Tikkunay Hazohar, which was printed as a separate book, includes 70 commentaries called Tikkunim, lit. repairs, and an additional 11 Tikkunim. In some editions, Tikkunim are printed that were already printed in the Zohar Chadash, which in their content and style also pertain to Tikkunay Hazohar. Each of the 70 Tikkunim of Tikkunay Hazohar begins by explaining the word Birashit. Bursit and continues by explaining other verses, mainly in Parashat Birashit, and also from the rest of Tanakh. And all this is in the way of Sa'd, in commentaries that reveal the hidden and mystical aspects of the Torah. Tikkunay Hazohar and Ra'aya Mahamna are similar in style, language, and concepts, and are different from the rest of the Zohar. For example, the idea of the four worlds is found in Tikkunay Hazohar and Ra'aya Mahamna but not elsewhere, as is true of the very use of the term, Kabbalah. In terminology, what is called Kabbalah in Tikkunay Hazohar and Ra'aya Mahamna is simply called Raisin clues or hints in the rest of the Zohar. In Tikkunay Hazohar there are many references to Chibor Akadma, meaning the earlier book. This refers to the main body of the Zohar. Topic. Parts of the Zohar, Summary of Rabbinic View The traditional rabbinic view is that most of the Zohar and the parts included in it i.e. those parts mentioned above were written and compiled by Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, but some parts preceded Rashbi and he used them such as Sifra Detznauda, see above, and some parts were written or arranged in generations after Rashbi's passing for example, Tanaim after Rashbi's time are occasionally mentioned. 
However, aside from the parts of the Zohar mentioned above, in the Zohar are mentioned tens of earlier sources that Rashbi and his Shevraya Kaddisha had, and they were apparently the foundation of the Kabbalistic tradition of the Zohar. These include Sefer Raziel, Sifra Diagatha, Sifra Diadam Harishan, Sifra Diashmedai, Sifra Chakmeda Allah Adivne Kedem, Sifra Dechinuk, Sifra Dishlomo Malka, Sifra Kadmai, Zarafay Diatvan Detmazru Liadam Began Eden, and more. In the Jewish view this indicates more, that the teaching of the Sa'd in the Book of the Zohar was not invented in the Tanaic period, but rather it is a tradition from ancient times that Rashbi and his Shevraya Kaddisha used and upon which they built and founded their Kabbalah, and also that its roots are in the Torah that was given by Hashem to Moshe on Sinai. Topic. Viewpoint and exegesis, rabbinic view According to the Zohar, the moral perfection of man influences the ideal world of the Sephirot, for although the Sephirot accept everything from the Ein Sof Heb. In sweepy infinity, the tree of life itself is dependent upon man, he alone can bring about the divine effusion. This concept is somewhat akin to the concept of Tikkun Olam. The dew that vivifies the universe flows from the just. By the practice of virtue and by moral perfection, man may increase the outpouring of heavenly grace. Even physical life is subservient to virtue. This, says the Zohar, is indicated in the words, For the Lord God had not caused it to rain, Gen. 2 5, which means that there had not yet been beneficent action in heaven, because man had not yet been created to pray for it. The Zohar assumes four kinds of biblical text exegesis, from the literal to the more mystical. The simple, literal meaning of the text, Peshat, the allusion or hinted, allegorical meaning, Remas. The rabbinic comparison through sermon or illustration and metaphor, Darash. The secret, mysterious, hidden meaning, saw the initial letters of these words P, R, D, S formed together the word Pardes, paradise, orchard, which became the designation for the Zohar's view of a fourfold meaning of the text, of which the mystical sense is considered the highest part. Topic. Academic views In Eros and Kabbalah, Moshe Idol, professor of Jewish mysticism, Hebrew University in Jerusalem, argues that the fundamental distinction between the rational philosophic strain of Judaism and mystical Judaism, as exemplified by the Zohar, is the mystical belief that the Godhead is complex rather than simple, and that divinity is dynamic and incorporates gender, having both male and female dimensions. These polarities must be conjoined, have yihud, union, to maintain the harmony of the cosmos. Idol characterizes this metaphysical point of view as dithyism, holding that there are two aspects to God, and the process of union as theoeroticism. This dithyism, the dynamics it entails, and its reverberations within creation is arguably the central interest of the Zohar, making up a huge proportion of its discourse pp. 5-56. Mention should also be made of the work of Elliot Wolfson, professor of Jewish mysticism, New York University, who has almost single-handedly challenged the conventional view, which is affirmed by Idol as well. Wolfson likewise recognizes the importance of heteroerotic symbolism in the Kabbalistic understanding of the divine nature. The oneness of God is perceived in androgynous terms as the pairing of male and female, the former characterized as the capacity to overflow and the latter as the potential to receive. Where Wolfson breaks with Idol and other scholars of the Kabbalah is in his insistence that the consequence of that heteroerotic union is the restoration of the female to the male. Just as, in the case of the original Adam, the woman was constructed from man, and their carnal cleaving together was portrayed as becoming one flesh, so the ideal for Kabbalists is the reconstitution of what Wolfson calls the male androgyne. Much closer in spirit to some ancient Gnostic dicta, Wolfson understands the eschatological ideal in traditional Kabbalah to have been the female becoming male see his circle in the square and language, eros, being. Topic. Commentaries The first known commentary on the Book of Zohar, Kedem Paz, was written by Rabbi Shimon Levi of Libya. Another important and influential commentary on Zohar 22 volume Or Yakur was written by Rabbi Moshe Cordovero of the Zafat i.e. Safed Kabbalistic school in the 16th century The Vilna Gaon authored a commentary on the Zohar 
Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch of Zidachov wrote a commentary on the Zohar entitled Adders Tzvi. A major commentary on the Zohar is the Sulam written by Rabbi Yehuda Ashlig. A full translation of the Zohar into Hebrew was made by the late Rabbi Daniel Frisch of Jerusalem under the title Misak Midvash. Influence Judaism On the one hand, the Zohar was lauded by many rabbis because it opposed religious formalism, stimulated one's imagination and emotions, and for many people helped reinvigorate the experience of prayer. In many places prayer had become a mere external religious exercise, while prayer was supposed to be a means of transcending earthly affairs and placing oneself in union with God, according to the Jewish Encyclopedia. On the other hand, the Zohar was censured by many rabbis because it propagated many superstitious beliefs, and produced a host of mystical dreamers, whose overexcited imaginations peopled the world with spirits, demons, and all kinds of good and bad influences. Many classical rabbis, especially Maimonides, viewed all such beliefs as a violation of Judaic principles of faith. Its mystic mode of explaining some commandments was applied by its commentators to all religious observances, and produced a strong tendency to substitute mystic Judaism in the place of traditional rabbinic Judaism. For example, Shabbat, the Jewish Sabbath, began to be looked upon as the embodiment of God in temporal life, and every ceremony performed on that day was considered to have an influence upon the superior world. Elements of the Zohar crept into the liturgy of the 16th and 17th centuries, and the religious poets not only used the allegorism and symbolism of the Zohar in their compositions, but even adopted its style, e.g., the use of erotic terminology to illustrate the relations between man and God. Thus, in the language of some Jewish poets, the Beloved One's curls indicate the mysteries of the deity, sensuous pleasures, and especially intoxication, typify the highest degree of divine love as ecstatic contemplation, while the wine room represents merely the state through which the human qualities merge or are exalted into those of God. In the 17th century, it was proposed that only Jewish men who were at least 40 years old could study Kabbalah, and by extension read the Zohar, because it was believed to be too powerful for those less emotionally mature and experienced. Experienced. Topic: Neoplatonism. Founded in the third century CE by Plotinus, the Neoplatonist tradition has clear echoes in the Zohar, as indeed in many forms of mystical spirituality, whether Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. See Avicenna, Maimonides, and Aquinas. The concept of creation by successive emanations of God, in particular, is characteristic of Neoplatonist thought. In both Kabbalistic and Neoplatonist systems, the Logos, or divine wisdom, is the primordial archetype of the universe and mediates between the divine idea and the material world. For example, the Neoplatonist Proclus describes the Logos in terms of the one beyond being. This primordial unity then, though self-complete, overflows with potency and from this power creates the manifold world beneath it. This downward movement from unity to multiplicity he calls procession. The reverse process of reversion is then the lower life forms, such as humanity, ascending back toward God through spiritual contemplation. Jewish commentators on the Zohar expressly noted these Greek influences. Topic: Christian mysticism. According to the Jewish Encyclopedia, the enthusiasm felt for the Zohar was shared by many Christian scholars, such as Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, Johann Reuchlin, Egedius of Viterbo, etc., all of whom believed that the book contained proofs of the truth of Christianity. They were led to this belief by the analogies existing between some of the teachings of the Zohar and certain Christian dogmas, such as the fall and redemption of man, and the dogma of the Trinity, which seems to be expressed in the Zohar in the following terms. The Ancient of Days has three heads. He reveals himself in three archetypes, all three forming but one. He is thus symbolized by the number three. They are revealed in one another. These are, first, secret, hidden, wisdom, above that the Holy Ancient One, and above him the Unknowable One. None knows what he contains, he is above all conception. He is therefore called for man, non-existing, Aeon, Zohar, E. 288b. According to the Jewish Encyclopedia, 
This and other similar doctrines found in the Zohar are now known to be much older than Christianity, but the Christian scholars who were led by the similarity of these teachings to certain Christian dogmas deemed it their duty to propagate the Zohar. However, fundamental to the Zohar are descriptions of the absolute unity and uniqueness of God, in the Jewish understanding of it, rather than a trinity or other plurality. One of the most common phrases in the Zohar is, Raza de Yachuda. The secret of his unity, which describes the oneness of God as completely indivisible, even in spiritual terms. A central passage, Patach Eliyahu Introduction to Tikkunay Zohar 17a, for example, says, Elijah opened and said, Master of the worlds. You are one, but not in number. You are he who is highest of the high, most hidden of the hidden, no thought can grasp you at all. And there is no image or likeness of you, inside or out. And aside from you, there is no unity on high or below. And you are acknowledged as the cause of everything and the master of everything. And you are the completion of them all. And as soon as you remove yourself from them, all the names remain like a body without a soul. All is to show how you conduct the world, but not that you have a known righteousness that is just, nor a known judgment that is merciful, nor any of these attributes at all. Blessed is God forever, Amen and Amen. The meaning of the three heads of Keter, according to the Kabbalists, has extremely different connotations from ascribing validity to any compound or plurality in God, even if the compound is viewed as unified. In Kabbalah, while God is an absolutely simple non-compound, infinite unity beyond grasp, as described in Jewish philosophy by Maimonides, through his Kabbalistic manifestations such as the Sephirot and the Shekhinah divine presence, we relate to the living dynamic divinity that emanates, enclothes, is revealed in, and incorporates, the multifarious spiritual and physical plurality of creation within the infinite unity. Creation is plural, while God is unity. Kabbalistic theology unites the two in the paradox of human versus divine perspectives. The spiritual role of Judaism is to reach the level of perceiving the truth of the paradox, that all is one, spiritual and physical creation being nullified into absolute divine monotheism. Ascribing any independent validity to the plural perspective is idolatry. Nonetheless, through the personalized aspects of God, revealing the concealed mystery from within the divine unity, man can perceive and relate to God, who otherwise would be unbridgeably far, as the supernal divine emanations are mirrored in the mystical divine nature of man's soul. The relationship between God's absolute unity and divine manifestations may be compared to a man in a room, there is the man himself, and his presence and relationship to others in the room. In Hebrew, this is known as the Shekhinah. It is also the concept of God's name, it is his relationship and presence in the world towards us. The wisdom literally written as field of apples in Kabbalistic terms refers to the Shekhinah, the divine presence. The unknowable one literally written as the miniature presence refers to events on earth when events can be understood as natural happenings instead of God's act, although it is actually the act of God. This is known as perceiving the Shekhinah through a blurry, cloudy lens. This means to say, although we see God's presence not God himself through natural occurrences, it is only through a blurry lens, as opposed to miracles, in which we clearly see and recognize God's presence in the world. The Holy Ancient One refers to God himself, who is imperceivable. See Minhas Yaakov an anonymous commentary in the Siddur Beis Yaakov on the Sabbath hymn of Askenu Sudasa, composed by the Arizal based on this lofty concept of the Zohar. Within the descending four worlds of creation, each successive realm perceives divinity less and apparent independence more. The highest realm Atzaluth emanation, termed the realm of unity, is distinguished from the lower three realms, termed the realm of separation. By still having no self-awareness, absolute divine unity is revealed and creation is nullified in its source. The lower three worlds feel progressive degrees of independence from God. Where lower creation can mistake the different divine emanations as plural, Atzaluth feels their non-existent unity in God. Within the constricted appearance of creation, God is revealed through various and any plural numbers. God uses each number to represent a different supernal aspect of reality that he creates, to reflect their comprehensive inclusion in his absolute oneness, ten sephirot, twelve parts of him, two forms of light, two parts of him and three heads in Keter, four letters of the Tetragrammaton, twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, thirteen attributes of mercy, etc. All such forms when traced back to their source in God's infinite light, return to their state of absolute oneness. This is the consciousness of Atzaluth. 
In Kabbalah, this perception is considered subconsciously innate to the souls of Israel, rooted in Atzilut. The souls of the nations are elevated to this perception through adherence to the seven laws of Noah, that bring them to absolute divine unity and away from any false plural perspectives. There is an alternative notion of three in the Zohar that is one. Israel, the Torah and the Holy One blessed be he are one. From the perspective of God, before constriction in creation, these three are revealed in their source as a simple non-compound absolute unity, as is all potential creation from God's perspective. In Kabbalah, especially in Hasidism, the communal divinity of Israel is revealed below in the righteous Zadok Jewish leader of each generation who is a collective soul of the people. In the view of Kabbalah, however, no Jew would worship the supernal community souls of the Jewish people, or the rabbinic leader of the generation, nor the totality of creation's unity in God itself, as Judaism innately perceives the absolute monotheism of God. In a Kabbalistic phrase, one prays, to him, not to his attributes. As Kabbalah sees the Torah as the divine blueprint of creation, so any entity or idea in creation receives its existence through an ultimate life force in Torah interpretation. However, in the descent of creation, the zimtzum constrictions and impure cliffith side of false independence from God result in distortion of the original vitality source and idea. Accordingly, in the Kabbalistic view, the non-Jewish belief in the Trinity, as well as the beliefs of all religions, have parallel, supernal notions within Kabbalah from which they ultimately exist in the process of creation. However, the impure distortion results from human ascription of false validity and worship to divine manifestations, rather than realizing their nullification to God's unity alone. In normative Christian theology, as well as the declaration of the First Council of Nicaea, God is declared to be one. Declarations such as, God is three, or God is two, are condemned in later councils as entirely heretical and idolatrous. The beginning of the essential declaration of belief for Christians, the Nicene Creed somewhat equivalent to Maimonides' Thirteen Principles of Faith, starts with the Shema-influenced declaration that, We believe in one God. Like Judaism, Christianity asserts the absolute monotheism of God. Unlike the Zohar, Christianity interprets the coming of the Messiah as the arrival of the true immanence of God. Like the Zohar the Messiah is believed to be the bringer of divine light. The light the Messiah shineth in the darkness and the darkness has never put it out. Yet the light, although being God, is separable within God since no one has seen God in flesh. For no man has seen God. John chapter 1. It is through the belief that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, since God had vindicated him by raising him from the dead, that Christians believe that Jesus is paradoxically and substantially God, despite God's simple undivided unity. The belief that Jesus Christ is God from God, light from light, is assigned as a mystery and weakness of the human mind affecting and affecting in our comprehension of him. The mystery of the Trinity and our mystical union with the Ancient of Days will only be made, like in the Zohar, in the New Garden of Eden, which is made holy by the light of God where people's love for God is unending. Topic. Zohar study Jewish view. Who should study Tikkunei Hazohar? Despite the preeminence of Tikkunei Hazohar and despite the topmost priority of Torah study in Judaism, much of the Zohar has been relatively obscure and unread in the Jewish world in recent times, particularly outside of Israel and outside of Chassidic groups. Although some rabbis since the Shabbatai Tzvi debacle still maintain that one should be married and 40 years old in order to study Kabbalah, since the time of Baal Shem Tov there has been relaxation of such stringency, and many maintain that it is sufficient to be married and knowledgeable in Halakha and hence permitted to study Kabbalah and by inclusion, Tikkunei Hazohar, and some rabbis will advise learning Kabbalah without restrictions of marriage or age. In any case the aim of such caution is to not become caught up in Kabbalah to the extent of departing from reality or halakha. Rabbinic accolades, the importance of studying Tikkunei Hazohar Many eminent rabbis and sages have echoed the Zohar's own urgings for Jews to study it, and have and urged people in the strongest of terms to be involved with it. To quote from the Zohar and from some of those rabbis, Viamaskalim Yavinu, but they that are wise will understand Dan, 1210 from the side of Binah understanding, which is the tree of life. 
Therefore it is said, Viamaskalam Yazahiru Kezohar Harakia, and they that are wise will shine like the radiance of the sky Dan, 12 by means of this book of yours, which is the book of the Zohar, from the radiance Zohar of Ima Allah the higher mother, the higher of the two primary parts of him that develop from Bina which is Teshiva, with those who study this work, trial is not needed. And because Yisrael will in the future taste from the tree of life, which is this book of the Zohar, they will go out, with it, from exile, in a merciful manner, and with them will be fulfilled. Hashem Badad Yanchenu, Vayan Emo El Necher, Hashem alone will lead them, and there is no strange God with him. Doi, 32 Woe to the people of the world who hide the heart and cover the eyes, not gazing into the secrets of the Torah. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov said the following praise of the Zohar's effect in motivating mitzvah performance, which is the main focus in Judaism. It is already known that learning the Zohar is very, very mesugal, capable of bringing good effects. Now know, that by learning the Zohar, desire is generated for all types of study of the Holy Torah, and the holy wording of the Zohar greatly arouses a person towards service of Hashem Yitbarak. Namely, the praise with which it praises and glorifies a person who serves Hashem, that is, the common expression of the Zohar in saying, Zakah, fortunate, etc. regarding any mitzvah, and vice versa, the cry that it shouts out, Vi, etc., Vi lay, Vi lenishmata, woe to him. Woe to his soul, regarding one who turns away from the service of Hashem, these expressions greatly arouse the man for the service of the Blessed One. Topic English translations Zohar pages in English, at ha-zohar.net, including the introduction translated in English Berg, Michael, Zohar 23 volume set the Kabbalah Center International. Full 23 volumes English translation with commentary and annotations. Matt, Daniel C., Nathan Volsky, and Joel Hecker, trans. The Zohar, Pritzker edition, 12 vols, Stanford, Stanford University Press, 2004-2017. Matt, Daniel C. Zohar, Annotated and Explained. Woodstock, Vermont, Skylights Paths Publishing Co., 2002. Selections, Matt, Daniel C. Zohar, The Book of Enlightenment. New York, Paulist Press, 1983. Selections, Sholem, Gershom, ed. Zohar, The Book of Splendor. New York, Shockin Books, 1963. Selections, Sperling, Harry and Maurice Simon, eds. The Zohar, Five Vols. London, Sanchino Press. Tishby, Isaiah, ed. The Wisdom of the Zohar, an Anthology of Texts, 3 vols. Translated from the Hebrew by David Goldstein. Oxford, Oxford University Press, 1989. Shimon Bar Yochai. Sefer Ha Zohar, Vol. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 English. CreateSpace, 2015. Topic. See also Bahir Pakashat Dor Dame Kabbalah, Primary Texts Moses de Leon Sefer Yetzirah Simeon Bar Yochai Treatise on the Left Emanation Topic. References Topic. Further reading Bayer, Klaus. Aramaic Language, Its Distribution and Subdivisions. 1986, from reference to above. Tenen, Stan, Zohar. Brashit, and the Meru Hypothesis, Scholars Debate the Origins of Zohar. Meru Foundation eToris Newsletter No. 40, July 2007 Blumenthal, David R. Three is not enough, Jewish reflections on Trinitarian thinking. In Ethical Monotheism, Past and Present, Essays in Honor of Wendell S. Dietrich, ed. T. Vial and M. Hadley, Providence, Re. Brown Judaic Studies. The Encyclopedia of Jewish Myth, Magic, and Mysticism, Jeffrey Dennis, Llewellyn Worldwide, 2007. Studies in the Zohar, Yehuda Liebs, author, Sunni Press, Sunni Series in Judaica, Hermeneutics, Mysticism, and Religion, 1993. Challenging the Master, Moshe Idel's Critique of Gershom Sholem. Micah Odenheimer, My Jewish Learning, Com, Kabbalah and Mysticism. Sholem, Gershom, Zohar in Encyclopedia Judaica, Keter Publishing. Sholem, Gershom, Kabbalah. In Encyclopedia Judaica, Keter Publishing. Margolis, Ruvain. Penanim U. Margolis. 
and Nitzotse Zohar, Heb, Mossad R. Cook, Luria, David, Cadmus Sefer Hazohar, Heb, Unterman, Alan Reinterpreting Mysticism and Messianism, My Jewish Learning, Com, Kabbalah and Mysticism, Adler, Jeremy, Beyond the Law, The Artistry and Enduring Counter Cultural Power of the Kabbalah. Times Literary Supplement, the 24th of February 2006. Reviewing: Daniel C. Matt, translator, The Zohar. Arthur Green, A Guide to the Zohar. Moshe Idol, Kabbalah and Eros. Topic: External links. Topic: Zohar texts. Spur Hajur Sefer Hazohar. Zohar text in original Aramaic. Tikkunay Zohar in English, partial intro and Tikkun 1 to 17. Zohar pages in English at hadashzohar.net, including the introduction translated in English and the importance of study of the Zohar and more. Zohar and related booklets in various formats in PDF files. Sefer Hazohar, Mantua edition, 1558, at the National Library of Israel, DJVU file. Sefer Hazohar, Cremona edition 1559, at the National Library of Israel, DJVU file Zohar text files txt HTML among Grimoire. CZ Hebrew Kabbalistic Texts Collection The Zohar in English, Bereshith to Lekh Lekha The Zohar in English, Some Mystical Sections The Kabbalah Center Translation of the Zohar Original Zohar with Sulam Commentary Daily Zohar Study of Tikkunay Zohar in English Zohar Complete English Translation Zohar Texts, Hebrew English, PDFs in G Drive Topic Links about the Zohar The Aramaic Language of the Zohar Seven Brief Video Lectures about the Zohar from Kabbalah Education and Research Institute Zohar and Later Mysticism, a short essay by Israel Abraham's Notes on the Zohar in English, an extensive bibliography The Zohar Code, The Temple Calendar of King Solomon. <laughs>